Hey there. Welcome to the first part of The Alchemist Tells a Lie. Um, we're going to talk about cocoa beans and everything I can think about them. Lie number one. I can't tell you everything I know about them. Uh, I'm not going to hold anything back, but I just can't remember it all. Um, we're going to talk about classifications. We're going to talk uh, maybe about sorting and cut tests. Um, and uh, genomes and just whatever comes to mind. I just want to start talking. So let's start off with the big one. Um, the hell, it's a big industry lie, as you want to call it, that there are three kinds of cocoa beans. There are Criollo, the rare heirloom, um, massively sought after cocoa. Um, there is Forstero, um, your bulk commodity cocoa. Um, low grade, you know, whatever, you know, Hershey's is made out of or whoever. Um, it's not really looked highly upon. Um, and if you crossbreed those, you get Trinitario. Um, and I guess in some way, you know, there is some truth there. Um, but it's not even close to the whole truth. And it's, it's just really something you can encompass your head around. So that there's Criollo, there's Forestero, and the mix is Trinitario. You're going to read that over and over and over. And it sounds good. It's good sound bites, and it's basically useless. Um, you know, there are some general trends to those very general classifications. Um, but they're not really true. It's, it's as true as saying there are two or three kinds of apples. You know, well, you have eating apples, and you have cider apples, and you have um, eating cider and, and uh, baking apples. Um, clearly, you know, there's a whole bunch more apples than that, and you don't classify them that way. Those are just general categories that give you, you know, kind of an impression. Um, baking apples, um, usually a little more tart. Um, Cider apples aren't very juicy. They're, they're hardly edible, but they press and make a good cider. Then you have eating apples that are high in sugar and are very flavorful eaten as is. But if you bake with them, the flavor kind of muddies down. If you ferment with them, it makes kind of a, um, a, a, a bodiless cider. Uh, it just isn't really good for them. They all have their, their token. So it's sort of the same way in cocoa. Um, you know, and, and as you, you're kind of noticing, I, I'm gesturing to columns here. So this whole group is considered Criollo. Um, I've got, you know, just happens to be uh, three beans that I've got in stock right now. Um, three different ones from Peru. Um, all pretty isolated areas. The strains are, um, and see there's that first word, strains. They're different. Um, they have different genetics. Um, they all generally are milder. They have, you know, some fruity tones. Um, but they taste pretty different. Um, and, you know, if I'm going to take the other side now, uh, forced arrow, um, supposedly the, the worst of the worst, commodity cocoa, but I've got three of them. Um, and it's because I like them. They, they, they taste good. They're what we're used to tasting as chocolate. Um, and again, they're, they're generally heavier chocolates, um, you know, brooding chocolates, more intense chocolate flavors. But the center one here, this is from the Ivory Coast. Um, it actually has some amazing delicate floral notes that in a forced arrow, you don't usually expect floral notes. You kind of expect that over here. But here it is over here. Um, and so we're talking then, you know, the middle road, the crossbreeding, um, which, you know, maybe that happened hundreds of years ago. These are pretty much strains that, that are going on in origin in the countries they are happening. They're not crossbreeding now. They're, they're hybrids, um, and they're pretty established strains. Um, cultivars is actually some of the more particular term, and I'm not going to get into them. Um, to be perfectly honest, I'm used to reading them, and I will mangle the pronunciations if I try. So I just not even going to try. Um, but but that said, um, you know this bean here. This one's from Honduras. It has some nice nutty flavors. 
You know, this one down here is from Nicaragua. It also has some nutty flavors. This middle one is from Ecuador. It's pretty well missing nutty. It's kind of well missing fruity. Um, but it has a good chocolate backbone. Um, but so does this one from Ghana. Um, what I'm trying to get at is take each bean for itself. Um, evaluate it. Don't go after one because it's Criollo, because everybody wants it. And you're going to hear that a lot. Oh, I want that. And there, there's actually a little sub variety of Criollo called Porcelano that um, people, frankly, really go crazy over. And I've had it twice now. Uh, no, three times. I, I've carried it twice. I've tasted it three times. Um, I carried it twice because there were some really amazing beans. It was very good. Um, but they were very different. One was really mild and it, it had some elegance to it. I'll grant that. Um, the other, um, I'm, I'm, I'm debating what to say, but it um, kind of tasted kind of musky and, well, kind of like sex, actually. And it was a really neat chocolate, not something, again, you'd think of as uh, Criollo. Um, but it was neat. That's why I bought it. I buy off a of taste, and I present to you on taste. Um, that said, that third one, that third porcelano that people s really go after, because it's porcelano, it's rare, tasted like dirt. <laughs> it was terrible. Um, you don't eat a name. You eat the chocolate and what it makes from it. Um, so, so don't get hung up on the names. Get hung up on the flavors. Um, so that's, that's the point that I've really rambled about that I wanted to get across to you. Um, each one of these has different genetics, and their own, their, they are their own genetics. Um, and so evaluate them from the, for themselves. Treat them you know, like you do people. Um, someone from Korea, someone from down the street, uh, someone from Wisconsin, whatever. Evaluate them for the person they are, not the label you've put on them. They're all different. Um, and, you know, even right here, Ecuador. Um, I've got four Ecuadors right now. Um, one is from a, the ubiquitous strain CCN51. Um, it's got a history of being, and rightly so, often very terrible. It's really bitter, really astringent most of the time. Um, I've got one that was actually fermented very nice. Um, and it, it has a good flavor. Um, so again, you can't even judge that book by its cover. Um, you've got to judge it for the bean it is. Um, which, I'm mean, again, I want to go into that a little bit. Everything I carry and how I carry it is based on how I evaluated it and what the evaluation was. I get a sample in. I roast it. I crack it and winnow it. I make it into chocolate. I taste it. Um, that's what I base the evaluation on. Um, much of commodity-grade cocoa come with spec sheets. And they say, you know, no more than 5% of slaty bean. Don't worry about what this means. You don't need to know. <laughs> um, no more than 25% unfermented. Um, and I'm making these numbers up, by the way. Um, no more than 2% insect damaged. Um, those are all quality things. Um, and, you know, the way the cocoa industry has come is really getting beyond that. Everything on this board is so far above that that you don't have to worry about the quality. It's about the flavor. Um, so I don't put those out. I, I, I don't even evaluate it because it doesn't do me any good. Um, if it happens to have... 5% um, insect damage, or maybe that's a bad example, but 5% unfermented, and I don't like the flavor, or to say zero unfermented, that should be great, but I don't like the flavor, I'm not going to buy it. Um, some beans are pristine, they look gorgeous, they have zero defects. Um, many, i found, beans from Brazil are that way. They look gorgeous, and they taste like dirt. <laughs> Um, it's just what it is. You can't, again, you can't judge it. You have to taste it. So um, I don't go with that. I, I, I don't worry about that. 
same deal. Um, these terms I'm using, slaty, unfermented, and all of that, are um, part of the, that industry where you, y there's a, something called a cut test. Um, you take 100 beans, it's supposed to be representative. You put them in this thing called a guillotine. Um, you lay them out, um, you close it up, and you press this blade down, and it cuts them in half, and you open it up. And it's a quick, simple way, while you are in origin, evaluating the bean to see if you want to even consider carrying it. It's a good, quick indicator of, is this at least quality? Um, I don't do cut tests. Uh, this is way past that. These are, you know, judged or ready to be, these are good beans. Now how do they taste? That's why I don't go with that. Um, and I don't expect you to go with that. Um, so you just uh, assume, and you have to. It's a trust issue. You, you, you can decide not to trust me, but I hope to build that trust with you getting beans, um, if tasti tasting them for yourself, and us building a reputation and a, and a relationship together. Um, that all said, this isn't meant to be a sales pitch. Um, I come down to, again, taste, and that's what I want you to do. Um, this comes down to what, again, a lot of people are getting into doing, which is sorting beans. Um, again, you notice I didn't mention sorting when I talked about my own evaluation. Um, and there's a really good reason for that, that, that for me at least. Um, I'm going to pull these back and do some sorting out here. Um, and the only option I have for sorting is my eyes. So I'm going to pull this one out. It's kind of wrinkly. Oh, this one's a shriveled one. Well, there's kind of a small one. Well, this one's cracked. Um, and you know, that one's kind of odd. And here's a bean that's cut in half even. Um, and you know, maybe these are not as good as they could be. Um, and that's not really the issue. Um, my big point on it though, and, I, and I'll show you with a couple of the other beans, is visual is a really poor way um, to sort beans. And the proof in that is the cut test itself. If you could tell what was inside a bean and its quality from the outside, you wouldn't have to cut it in half. It's really that simple. Um, and so, I mean, really, there it is. That, that's, <laughs> that's my case for not sorting. Um, that's one of the point I was getting to is I don't sort any of the beans. Um, you know, to move it even further along, I'm just going to line up some random ones here. You know, just there they are. Same number. You know, one, one for one. I just picked them randomly right out of that pile. Um, and I have done this with some roasted ones. And what you find is, wow, okay, I didn't pick out identical ones, but wow, those look identical. And I'll go through and I will eat each one of them. And they're going to taste different. Some will be good. Most will be good. Um, some may not be good, um, but there was no way for me to tell from the outside. And it would be pompous of me to think I could. Um, you know, people do want to have a hand in it. I get that. There's plenty of places for you to have a hand in it. But this isn't one of them. Um, and I'm going to go to a, a slightly different point on that even. Um, you know, I, I, off the top of my head, I honestly can't come up with the example. But um, in cooking recipes, you often throw in something bitter or astringent, something sharp that you would never eat on its own. Um, hey, well, here we go, allspice, crunching up an allspice. That's pretty hardcore. You just don't do it. But in a recipe, it gets this depth of flavor. Um, I propose to you that even if a bean doesn't taste good, it gives a depth of flavor to the entire chocolate. And um, I've actually done this. I have sorted for sight. I've made the two batches of chocolate. Um, and, and honestly, I actually did it post-roasting so that I had the same exact roast. Um, and I, I gave them out to various people, blind tasting, you know, what do you like best? And to a person, everybody liked the unsorted one better. It had a, a richer flavor. 
Um, the other one was considered kind of, you know, just not as good. It was, it was okay. It was fine. Um, and to be perfectly fair, I've talked to some chocolate makers who do sort their beans and have done this same test. And for some beans, okay, it was valid. They liked it better sorted. More power to them. And that's actually the purpose of this, uh, this chocolate making yourself. You make the chocolate that you like. You want to sort? Do it. But please don't do it because you think you're improving it without any data to back it up. Um, that's the real point. Um, and, and, you know, I'll go backwards here, or I'm going to put those back up. Um, you know, we're going to look at, I'm going to pull this one over here. These things are so consistent that there's nothing to sort. But again, you cut test them, they may look different. And actually, this particular, this is, this is the nice point. This is a bean called, uh, this is from Peru, and it's one called Marignan. And it has, inside the pods themselves, um, both the classic purple, po uh, purple bean, and intermixed in it at about a 40% ratio, um, white beans. Um, porcelano, if you want to call it that, but it's not porcelano because it's not pure. Um, but those occur in the same pod. And looking at them right here, I can't tell them apart. There's no way. Until I crack open each one, um, I'm not going to see the difference, but they're going to taste radically different. Um, so, you know, another case, don't sort. Um, and then the final one is, I don't sort. I'm giving you a flavor profile um, and descriptions based on unsorted. You're going to modify that and change that if you do. Feel free to try it, of course, but don't do it blindly. That's really what I'm going to say about that. Um, that's actually also about all I have to say about cocoa beans that come to mind. Um, it's quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure we'll ever know everything there is about them. They, they cross beat like crazy. Um, there's a, a, a fun little quote someone gave to me once or a, a saying was, the only thing more promiscuous than a human is a cocoa bean. So these things crossbreed. You get new flavors all the time. Um, and actually, there we go. One more thing did come to mind, um, if you weren't aware of it. Um, cocoa beans start off in pods, in fruits. Um, here we go. This is a dried one. It's a little pretty small one. They, they can get actually pretty large. Um, there's dried cocoa beans in there. Um, and those are split open, and those are put into piles. And the natural um, biome and um, uh, organisms, yeasts, molds, funguses, um, that just naturally occur in the environment that these things um, are in, start um, inoculating uh, that big mass. Um, it's full of, you know, uh, sugars from the inside of the fruit. It's a fruit. Um, and they start fermenting. Um, and, you know, um, th over time, you know, we're talking, you know, uh, one, well, usually two to five days, these ferment in piles, they stir them, and lots of chemical reactions occur. Um, if you taste a raw, unfermented bean from the pod, it tastes nothing like chocolate. Um, after it's fermented and dried, there's this little hint of something that might be chocolate at some point. When you roast them eventually, that's when that chocolate flavor, all those chemicals that have been forming, get together and form a bunch of compounds that one mixed together we think of as chocolate. Um, so it's a big microbe dance and a bunch of chemistry that gets to that flavor. Um, the point I was getting to is fermentation can make a huge difference in a bean. Um, you can have two different, excuse me, two of the same exact bean crop fermented two different ways and they will taste radically different. And so again, don't do a disservice to the beans and the farmer who fermented them by saying, damn it, I want beans from Peru. Well, why? Well, they, they taste this way. No, some of them taste that way. This one tastes different from this one and different from this one. Um, you, th they're not going to allow you to shove them into little cubby holes. You've got to take them for what they are. Um, 
you know, the CCN 51 is that perfect example. People throw it out to the woodshed because it's CCN 51. Um, but every so often you treat it right, you can get a pretty good chocolate. Um, so there, I think that was finally the last thing. Again, I just want to reinforce. Take each one for its own. Um, stop trying to put them in. Uh, little cubby holes. Um, learn. Enjoy. That's what this is really all about. Make the chocolate you want to make. Um, experiment, taste, um, and try not to make assumptions. We're all, we're all going to do it, but just be aware you're doing it where, and where you're doing it and try to keep it to a minimum. Um, that's it. Um, we're going to take some beans next and get them roasting and get through the whole process of making chocolate. Thanks for listening. <laughs>